the price of electricity. New electricity is going to be expensive wherever it comes from, believe me. If we use uh, wind power, what will happen to our industry? So, I mean, uh, we're not going to, I'm not planning in this evening's talk to get into all the ins and outs of energy policy. But the nuclear industry, in its enthusiasm for the technology, has had a tendency, right from the beginning, to overemphasize the benefits and to deny the risks. So, let's begin with the very basic question, what is nuclear energy? It turns out that the uranium atom is the only atom occurring in nature from which we can derive large amounts of energy. This is a model of not the uranium atom intact, but the uranium atom at the moment when it's being split. This is in Russia. Russia is great at having monuments. Now, the semicircles are representing the energy that's released when this happens. It's a lot. Of course, in the original use, it was for weapons, for nuclear bombs. And when they exploded these bombs, it scatters the fission products far and wide in the environment. But when this uh, testing was going on, there was one scientist, a winner of two Nobel Prizes, his name was Linus Pauling, who said, this is crazy. Uh, the, government's, the government would like to ignore him, but it's difficult to ignore a man who's won two Nobel Prizes. And what he said is that the radioactive products of this explosion will be killing about 96,000 Americans every year. And it was really the result of this concern about the effect on health that atmospheric testing was stopped by the United States without an agreement with the Soviet <coughs> Union. They stopped it unilateral. It's an interesting historical fact that uh, without any agreement, the Soviet Union also stopped atmospheric testing two months later. And it was only two years later that they signed a treaty called the Atmospheric Test Ban Treaty, which stands to this day and which uh, prevents uh, the uh, atmospheric testing of these weapons. Now, the whole idea of nuclear power is to try and take this destructive power of the bomb and harness it for good uh, to boil water. Boiling water can then produce steam and turn a turbine and generate electricity. While it's producing electricity, it is also producing large, enormous quantities, in fact, of these fission products. For example, iodine-131 is one of these radioactive materials. That's a yoda? Uh, yoda. Yoda. Yoda 131. And it's just exactly the same as ordinary yoda, except it's radioactive. And like ordinary iodine, it goes to the thyroid gland in the neck here. It's very dangerous, especially for young children, because not only can you get thyroid cancer, but it can also cause mental retardation. It can cause various developmental problems, stunted growth, and other types of medical problems as well. And in Canada, and in most other countries, I think, they, they distribute to the population around a nuclear reactor iodine pills. Pills are to be kept in your medicine cabinet uh, in case there is some kind of incident at the nuclear reactor where iodine is released, because that can happen. If your thyroid gland gets a lot of non-radioactive iodine, then it will not want the radioactive iodine. Your body will reject the radioactive iodine. So it's a way of trying to prevent your body from storing up this radioactive material. Now another fission product is cesium-137. Uh, this is radioactive cesium and it goes to the muscle tissue. It goes to all the soft tissues in an animal we'd say that's the meat. It goes into the meat. And this is the main reason why the reindeer were affected. The reindeer uh, got cesium-137 which made the reindeer meat unusable for human consumption. So in both Swedish Lapland and I guess, I'm not sure, but in Finnish Lapland probably, they had to put aside uh, this reindeer meat, it was too contaminated for human consumption. Even today in northern England, you can check this on the internet, there's hundreds of sheep farms where they're not allowed to sell their sheep meat. And this is because of continuing contamination of cesium-137 from the Chernobyl accident more than 20 years ago. So this is the kind of problem we're facing with another substance, for just for a final example, strontium-90, now that goes to the bones, it's like calcium. So it's complicated when these things escape because they follow many different pathways through the environment, they follow many different pathways through the human body, they get transmitted by different living things. 
All the engineers and nuclear scientists do everything that they can think of to prevent any of this stuff from getting out into the environment. But humans are not perfect and machines are not perfect and it sometimes happens. In fact, it always happens to a very small degree. But they do build up. Now, I, I was first uh, really uh, amazed uh, when I read a report in 1976 written by a British nuclear scientist. Uh, this man's name was Sir Brian Flowers. He worked in both the weapons business of Britain and also in the peaceful nuclear energy side. And in his report, which was a government report, he pointed out that if nuclear power had been developed before World War II and had been put in place around Europe before World War II, then large areas of Europe would be uninhabitable today because of World War II. The simple point being that these would have been targeted by the bombers, by the saboteurs, uh, and so on. So no technology is necessarily that good when it comes to people who really are determined to make it malfunction. And in my, intellect, in my uh, education, my personal education, this was a major event because from that point on I realized that if you're going to have nuclear power widespread, you can't afford any conventional wars.